Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Forecast is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Forecast is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code Forecast7. What sort of future do you think we're heading for? How will we live as we slip into the 21st century? Welcome to Forecast, episode 83. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Scott Johnson. Is that you breathing into the sighing? That I don't think so. Mike? It might have been my dog. We've got him, like that. got him too close to the mic. <laughs> uh, anyway, welcome to Forecast. I'm Tom Merritt. And uh, I'm Scott Johnson. And uh, we are very excited to once again be looking at the future with a couple of great guests. Joining us for this journey is Mignon Fogarty. You know her as Grammar Girl, podcaster, book writer, entrepreneur, skier and founder of the Quick and Dirty Tips Podcasting Network. Thank you for coming back on the show after we messed up your last booking. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. You know, mistakes happen. That's fine. I tried to find you on Twitter, and everyone was on the road. <laughs> I know. Well, we, we had accidentally booked you for, for Memorial Day uh, and, and didn't realize we weren't doing a show that day. So <laughs> my apologies for that. Uh, it's great that, that we got you back on and we're able to reschedule. Also joining us, Eva Snyder, visual effects artist from Chicago, but you're now in Los Angeles. Right? Uh, that's right. Did you survive Carmageddon? Uh, I went to Vegas during Carmageddon. <laughs> Smart move. Uh, well, I heard it wasn't as bad as everybody thought. Carmageddon, if you don't know, is uh, the, they closed down the 405 over the weekend to do some work. 405 is a main artery around Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, it, everybody said it was super clear. We had no problem leaving or getting back. So Everybody stayed off the roads. Maybe they yeah. should just do it more often for fun. That would be awesome. <laughs> All right, Scott, shall we get to some predictions from listeners? I think so. The listeners always have something interesting to stay. I'm I'm guessing today we'll get something as equally interesting, if not more, than previous episodes, Tom. Pressure is on you, Cohen Hendricks of Liverpool, who says, I predict there will be a rough brain-machine interface within 100 years. Any machine equipped with the right sensors will be able to accurately detect pain, happiness, sadness, guilt, smelling some stinky... A tasty taste, a bad taste, and other basic brain activity. Useful for status updates and for monitoring your loved ones. Moreover, devices will be able to create those emotions in the brain, too, in the same rough fashion. For example, want a richer cinema experience? A true motion, copyright, movie ensures you will cry and smile as the director intended it. Think about detecting guilt during court cases or enforcing guilt and or happiness in prisoners. Think about making sure children are happy in school. Think about making average food taste like a feast, but in a very generic way. I couldn't say what is this gray stuff tastes like, but it tastes good. Uh, in any case, wild protests will ensue against this technology. What is the value of an emotion if it's artificially enforced on your brain? But then again, wasn't the brain a chemical factory all along? Will the dissection of the brain's workings be the fissure that splits the population into the technologists and the rejectors? Man, a jam-packed prediction there from Cohen. Yeah, I like this one. Um, but what I don't like is the forcing your brain to feel the way the director wants you to feel in the, in the movie scenario. I don't like the idea that, that we would no longer have as much as I don't always enjoy their opinions, we would no longer have haters. We would no longer have fanboys. We would be this, you know, middle thing that can't think for itself. And I don't, I don't like that. I like the diversity of opinion, op- opinions. I want to hear what Ebert says, but I also want to hear what, you know, Joker at the New York Times says or, or whatever. I want to know that, that when I go, I'm going to have my own unique experience, that, that the director's vision is going to wash over me in a slightly different way than the guy next to me. And taking that out takes out a lot like it seems like it would for the director anyway it would improve the overall reason for making a movie in the first place but for me as a viewer i need to have i need to come with my baggage see it with my eyes and walk away with my own conclusions mignon what do you what do you think would you want to go to a movie if they were just going to force you to like it I think there's no way that sane people will have things implanted into their brain for entertainment purposes. I think the technology will exist for disabled people, for you know, people who need extra help with their brain function, but I don't think you or I will go get something implanted in our brain just for fun. 
Can, can, I can't make you feel happier about this? <laughs> no. Because you won't no take the way. implant. That's why. What about you, Eva? What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I actually have to agree. I mean, how can you have an effective message if you're forcing everyone to agree with your message? Um, you wouldn't have you know, effective art or, or be able to criticize or you know, disseminate between good and bad or, or what people enjoy if everybody's forced to just like it. So but we don't have a it's the whole, sense of style. It, it's the whole you need to fail a few times before success can taste, taste as sweet as success is capable of tasting. And it's the same kind of idea. As technology gets closer and closer to a place where we could do these sorts of things, I think people will get less and less inclined to embrace these kinds of technologies and will probably start to reject them. He, he says, well, we divide it into a, you know, a, a, a nation of technologists and rejectors. I think it's not so much that it's technology that we'll reject. It's when technology goes just a little bit too far. And this is, an, I think it would be an example of that. And it would not, you know, if, if George Lucas is going to tell me that I'm happy that Han didn't shoot first. That's a problem. We need the haters because it, it creates discussion and creative differences and that kind of stuff, while sometimes super negative and, and angry, I think in, in the end adds, you know, adds to the discussion and creates a, probably a better ecosystem of, of thought and creative ideas and, and better execution than it would if we were just all, you know, I believe this is the greatest thing I've ever seen because the director told me so. It would be just a terrible, terrible idea. But you wouldn't know. Well, you just like mm -hmm. it. You just wouldn't. Yeah. But see, that's the, that's the problem. That I fear the most because if I'm, you know, tr listen, Truman Show is a good example. If I'm in a place where I think it's all normal, but I'm actually being, you know, manipulated and, and filmed and whatever, I think this would make a great movie by itself, by the way. Um, and maybe, there, maybe there's a lot of movies like this. I mean, Logan Run and others sort of, uh, you know, speak to this kind of central idea. But the idea that we were, we're being sort of pushed around and told what we like and what we don't like, somebody will rise up and then there's a mess. There's blood on everyone's hands. There's a war. There's a starting over. There's more Michael Bay films ripping off The Running Man. I mean, we don't want to go that far. <laughs> but you'll like going there. No, okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Cohen, for your uh, prediction. It's, good. it's a good one. Definitely uh, discussion worthy. Send us your predictions, folks, and we will read them on the show. Email forecastpodcast at gmail.com or post them up at our blog, forecastpodcast.com. Let's move into the short term predicting. And Mignon, we'll start with you. These are things you think will happen sooner rather than later. What are you going to start us off with? Right. Well, I'm an author and there's been a lot of talk about ebooks and the role that they're going to play and driving down prices. So, but all the talk is about self-publishing, how people who are self-publishing will drive down the price of ebooks. And while I do think prices will go down, I think that it will be driven by older established authors who have a large backlist of books for which they own the ebook rights. So publishing contracts until, I don't know, five or ten years ago didn't include ebook rights. So a lot of older authors own the rights to books that their publishers have published. So they have those old books, they can put them online as ebooks for whatever price they want. And I think it's those older established authors with a big backlist that are going to drive the prices down of ebooks. I agree. I, you know what? I think you're right. I think as we've seen over and over again, it's it's the brick and mortar institutions that end up kind of setting the standard in digital activities, uh, for lack of a better word. I mean, we we've seen that it wasn't all of the dot coms in the dot com era that succeeded, with your exceptions of the eBay and Amazons, but it was you know barnesandnoble.com doing just fine or or in or in uh, electronics best buy uh you know setting the standard for for electronics so it's a combination and i and i think this is another example of of how that will work so so this is all in the wake of the closure of borders or the closure of the of the last bit of borders or what was borders and i can't help but think and we're talking really about just the the retail arm of things but it seems like in the case of something like you know, Barnes & Noble, they made really strong efforts very early on, so a little bit in the shadow of what Amazon was doing. But they said, all right, well, we're going to get into this e-reader market. We're going to make this stuff more accessible. We're going to have a store that's worthy of, of people's time and money. And they've been able to sort of ride that uh, at least enough to, to call it their own piece of the, of the larger pie. And it feels like to me, if a company wants to uh, uh, succeed, and if ultimately, uh, speaking of books in, you know, in particular, I think if, if, if books want to, to continue to succeed into whatever this new era brings, 
uh, with ebooks and other forms of consuming books. The companies themselves, the publishing part of this, the, the, the agent part of this, and the author part of this, all kind of have to get on whatever the train is that, it, that it's on. And so if it's ebooks and you got to get them on, you got to get your books out there and you've got to get them on Amazon's Kindle, well, then that's what you got to do. And if you fight that, if you blockbuster Netflix, uh, you're going to die. You're going to go away. And, I, and sadly, I, they're, I, they're, I have author friends who say that they can't stand this new ecosystem. They hate that they would have to put their book out on ebook to get any recognition. They like the old system. They like waiting and you know getting rejected a hundred times before something got through. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know what the value in, in is in fighting that because it just seems like either you get on that train or you don't. Um, yeah, I don't well, know, I'm sure a train is the right metaphor, but you know. Well, you think about music and it's gone digital, and musicians make less money from an album that they produce now, or even a single, and they make their money touring. And I think authors are going to have to take more ownership of the marketing of their own books. And I was in a comedy club a few nights ago and I was thinking, this is an awful lot like a book signing uh -huh. without the books. And so I can see that there, you know, and authors are not social people. We tend to like to, you know, be at our computers alone writing. But for authors who can be social and can perform, I think some of those authors will start touring in a way that's focused more on entertaining their audience than on just reading straight from their books. And that, you know, I mean, there's this established network. Maybe it'll be comedy clubs, maybe it won't. But there are empty stages in every city every night. So I think we'll see a few authors try trying to make that leap from author to entertainer as a way to bolster their book marketing. Well, here's a, here's a question. So either you're a visual artist, you, you understand mm -hmm. what it means to entertain, but also create and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it, this reminds me of webcomic artists. There's an analog for lots of different content creators in this conversation, including podcasters. Mm -hmm. Really, it applies to everybody on the web or this idea that as everything moves to this sort of anybody can make it kind of model, you have to do special things. You can't just sit back and go, I'm the author, I wrote this, have a nice day. The Stephen King days may be well behind us. How do you as a graphics and visual artist see the future of your medium and I think as an analog to what authors deal with or musicians or anyone else? Well, with, with my medium, it's still a very visual thing. So, you know, you go to the movies and it's an experience, although, you know, obviously you have more and more people who are trying to create, recreate that experience at home. So you end up with just bigger and bigger, flashier effects and bigger, bigger blockbuster movies because everybody is trying to grab hold of this audience. You know, this summer obviously it's very competitive where there's tons of huge movies. But um, in the book realm, books, like I read a lot. So for me, books are very personal. Like I come home and at night I sit down with my Kindle and I read. And um, it's like a moment to step into someone else's world or creation that I, as I envision it. So it's... It's definitely interesting, this idea of like authors wanting to go out and essentially becoming entertainers as, as an effect of the online market. But um, I don't know. It's, it feels like such a personal thing to me um, that, like, or something that's such like my time that um, I would rather just stay home and buy the books online and read my books or listen to them in the car or and have that moment with my books. But I know not everybody. And, but like, imagine if, if 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 Stephen King or John Grisham or I don't know a mainstream artist or a mainstream author rather, kind of was forced into a position where he had to run his own con, you know, had to have like King Kong. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty That's awesome, awesome, actually. That yeah, is awesome. Kind of awesome. Great, actually. But, yeah, I and he would get up and he would keynote it, and he would have special guests there, and his son would do something, and you know, they would they would kind of build community around what was, you know, what is a, not a dying art form, but a changing art form. And, and maybe that's the way we retain loyal leadership or readership rather. Or well, leadership like for that, that would be really good for like introducing, like if, if almost like a mentorship where you have, you know, bigger, well-known authors who, you know, you've been around a really long time and you want to curate those you know who are talented because the problem with ebooks is there's so many and you you go to the store and you can sit there and flip through the books and read the covers and or the first chapter even and and in the situation with ebooks there's like a million ebooks and everybody's self-publishing now you don't really know what to buy and you just have to go based on like whatever amazon recommends you kind of so in that sense you could almost have like if they wanted to mentor in new new authors or other young people who are are up and coming 
and then you make it sort of then you make it an event where it's like come and see what we have to offer and then you can go home with it right away and that brings us back to your original point, Mignon, which is established authors are the ones who are going to be able to drive down the ebook prices because not only do they have the rights, but they have the audience. People are already familiar with them. So if I'm going to, you know, take a risk, even if it is only 99 cents for a book, I'm going to take it on an established author. I'm going to see a Stephen King book for cheap. I'm going to go for that because I know like, oh, yeah, a lot of my friends like this book and that's going to, to sell better. I, we've seen that in the music industry already where having MP3 easily available and easy to publish has not meant the rise of the independent artist nearly as much as maybe some people thought it would when it first came out. Right. I've read that some established artists or authors already are um, charging for their, their book readings. Um, I'm not sure if it's the, the bookstores or the authors who are doing it. I think it may be the bookstores who have decided they can't give the space away free. But it, at some level, people are already on occasion paying a small ticket price to go see a very established author when they come to their city. And then I remember reading also that Neil Gaiman was doing something with audiobooks. Um, Audible has a new program where they're trying to get more audiobooks out and I think Neil Gaiman is curating or creating his own imprint within Audible but somehow he's selecting audiobooks that he thinks his readers will enjoy so it's already happening in places here and there yeah I'm paying to go see George R.R. R. Martin next week uh, and 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 you get the book is the thing so it doesn't they did it smart it wasn't like oh now we're suddenly just going to pay for something that used to be free it, they added something in they're like when you come you'll get the book you'll get be able to get it signed so you feel like oh okay well i'm paying for more than just sitting down in the audience this is you know this is a package right too many people were going to book signings and then going home and buying the book on amazon <laughs> yeah it's a great way to sell the books right and especially yeah. the old dead tree versions all right, let's move over to you, Eva. Your short-term prediction, maybe in the next few years, uh, what do you see in your short-term crystal ball? All right, well, um, assuming the economy were to continue to go down, um, this is sort of based on um, how there used to be the old steel towns where a steel company would come in and build up a town and sort of subsidize everything so that people would come and work for them and live in their town. So um, sort of what I was thinking with them, have you ever heard people getting their weddings sponsored by companies and that kind of thing? Um, the idea that your whole life could essentially be sponsored by a corporate company, like you need the money, so you become a, want, a walking sponsorship of, of like Pepsi, like you're always going to have Pepsi products, but then they, they subsidize your school for you or you live in like certain areas and, and sort of this idea of um, you get permanent consumers because you've fed into this pool of people who are always going to be like your products are great and the service yeah could you so could you here's i love this idea i mean i kind of love it in a science fiction kind of way but i don't <laughs> think a I, want little, it, uh... I don't want it to be real in a way because i don't <laughs> want to be bought and sold in that way but it seems like as we get better at better better and better at technologies that make microtransactions easy and simple mm -hmm. um be really nice if if that was so easy and simple and it happens so much in the background that all these little micropayments that Pepsi paid you for drinking their thing, like a percentage of what you paid to, to buy that drink went to some, it went back to you somehow. And eventually like a, you know, like a subway card, you drink 10 Pepsis and you get a case for free or something. And then you go eat a cert, certain such and such restaurant and you drive such and such car. And in a kind of almost game theory way, all of these devices, items and things are feeding back into your bank. You, they're paying you to, to use these people it seems like you couldn't do that with the entire population though right like you couldn't just yeah, how, no, do, you, no, how was, do you see that would it just be some individuals that have maybe yeah, more it, exposure like, than others you'd have like a, a pool or like I, I guess it's it's the way like you know your family goes or you're there you know they're about to have you know a kid or something and like oh we really need some way to like help us fulfill this cost Let's have our baby, our baby, sponsored by you know Pepsi or Coke or whoever, and and that that helps f you know give them a better shot in the future. But at the same time, now it's like that whole family is a Pepsi family, and they tell their friends, you know, oh this is this is what we always drink or this is what we do, and and it's thanks to this company. You know, and will you have will you have competing situations where I can't go over to your house because I'm a Coke family? <laughs> Maybe that'd be that'd be crazy, but in a in a subsidized world, that 
could be the case. It's the idea that, that corporations would want, want to find more and more ways into your life so that you always are, you're always coming back. Like, it's to, the, the idea that they want to build um, a consumer base that they'll never lose. And that consumer base infects other populations. You know, we already kind of do this. Uh, I don't know if you look at you look around at people's clothing. Uh, you know, d people often have shirts that say the name of the clothier, and you paid for them. You're not even getting yeah. anything. It's not it's not free at all. But there's there's lots of free advertising uh, going on. So it's it's not as far fetched as yeah. you might think. Uh, Mignon, I don't know if you remember, but uh, there used to be a program to get a free car as long as you were willing to drive it around with it wrapped in advertising. Do you, do I remember that when I first started Grammar Girl, I looked into getting my car wrapped with a uh, Grammar Girl. <laughs> logo to see what it would be. I went into a sign company. They had no idea what I was talking about, <laughs> but, but I remember it. People were wrapping their cars in exchange for, I don't know, was it $500, $1,000 a month yeah, in yeah. They, advertising? It, it, was, it, it was something that would you know, cover a car payment, essentially, so it was a, it was a good trade-off, but would you do that? Would you, would you live your life sponsored that way? I'd do it for my own company. Well, but yeah, that's a difference, for, though. I mean, for somebody <laughs> else, just to get stuff for free. It'd mm -hmm. be funny if you had a wristband that said, oh, I'm sorry, you, you're not allowed to buy Coke. <laughs> you're a Pepsi person. <laughs> I'm trying to that's sneak when it, in. That's when it gets all Orwellian and scary, I guess. But, yeah, I, the, the idea that we all become the living by um, sort of... I don't know, biological equivalent to a NASCAR car is a little <laughs> disconcerting to me. I don't want to, like that loyalty can be thrown around a little bit. There's certain things that I am loyal to, certain products I really like, and, and I'm happy to tell people and give lots of good word of mouth. Um, but the minute you have to change an alliance, as long as we always have the freedom to say, well, uh, Dell was okay, but today I feel better about Apple's you know, chances in the market, so I'm, I'm going to change allegiances to whatever I like better right now. If we always had that freedom, to do that, then that'd be fine with me. I think it's Let's an interesting it. prediction. Uh, I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll ever <laughs> buy, buy into anything like that. Uh, but it is time to uh, take a break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. Scott, we use it for forecast. We do. Uh, it's awesome. How simple is it? Tom Merritt. Even Tom Merritt can go and make a very functional website. Someone as distracted and, and horrible at spelling as me. Can can put it put together a website and keep it up to date. Uh, they they have uh, all kinds of modules if you want to include things things like your Flickr, your Twitter. Uh, they allow for easy import and export. So if you've got a blog right now and you're thinking, you know what, I just need something that's a little more reliable. You know, I'm starting to get a lot of traffic. I don't want it to go down. Uh, or if you want to create something really easy to use for someone else and import their old blog into it, you can do that. Also, Squarespace believes in data portability. They're not going to lock you in. If you want to take your data with you, if you leave Squarespace, you get to take it with you. So it is the thing to try. If you want good, fast, and easy, reliable blogging, check it out, squarespace.com. 24 hours a day, seven days a week support if you need it, although you're not going to need it all that often because it's so easy to use. Try it out for free, squarespace.com. Sign up for a free account. You don't need a credit card or anything. Just put in your name and what what you want the site to be called and start messing around with it. If you like it and you decide to keep it, use the offer code FORECAST7 and get 10% off for six months. That's squarespace.com, the offer code FORECAST, F-O-U-R-C-A-S-T, and then the number seven. And we thank them for their support of FORECAST. Let's, uh, let's now move to our long-term predictions. And Eva, we'll stick with you. Uh, <laughs> these are the more 100 years sort of things. What do you got for us? All right, so in the next 100 years, I think there'll be a lot more um, uh, genetic vanity kind of things that you'll be able to do. Um, and I don't mean just like what you want for your kids, but like you'll be able to walk into a shop and get like weird like skin things that aren't just tattoos, but more a little more like, um, I don't know if you guys have seen the articles about like the kittens and puppies that glow in the dark. It's the kind of thing where like someone would be able to give you a tattoo, but instead of it being ink, they'd be able to switch on or change out um, the different parts of your, your DNA to, to activate this glow in the dark aspect. And so then you'd have like glow in the dark tattoos or, or you'd be able to do it with like hair color and end up with like blue hair or something like wild that stuff that appears in strange places in nature but then you know people become more and more what's the next big style that you can do with your your body and you end up like doing more and more crazy things 
Well, this is, I tell you what I want, and I've always said I'd do this, so I'm not a big tattoo guy. I'm not really all into, like, implants or any of this kind of stuff people do. You know, people getting horns in their heads and all this stuff. But here's one that I would do, and I think this feeds into your prediction because it's a more, it's a different kind of creativity. It's not the same. It's just sort of, I'm rebelling against the man. I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to put spines in my ears or whatever. I want to put Tron-like, like, uh, neon light runners from my ears down my neck. And it would be implanted under my skin so that you would just get the faint pulsating blue, like a blue track of light that's just constantly <laughs> pulsating through my neck. Like I'm some sort of cyborg freaking robot. And I think that would be really cool. And I'd want to be able to turn it off or on. I'd want to be able to like flip it on in a movie theater and freak everybody out or whatever. And just kind of have that going and have it run off, you know, natural body electricity or something. Those kinds of things, like those kinds of options, I think would appeal to a much broader base than those who are interested in body augmentation or just getting tattoos or whatever. Please be considerate to others and turn <laughs> off your bioluminescence before the movie begins. <laughs> totally. You know that would happen, too. That would totally happen. I love that idea. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's totally plausible, too, like taking some kind of bioluminescence or some kind of blue dye that exists in nature and being able to splice it in uh, we know what Scott's going to do. Mignon, have you, got a, uh, have you got something in mind that you might take advantage of if we get this technology? Well, I always try, I always try to take the practical route. So instead of thinking about freaking people out in the movie theater, I'm thinking, how can this be useful? Maybe I can have a, a light in my hand so that when I want to read in bed, uh, I can yeah. just turn it on and always have it with me or something like that. We all become X-Men. We all, we, but, but we get to choose what our mutation would be. I'm, I'm kind of like you. I'm thinking of what I could do that would be useful. Uh, but, but really... Um, That's I, the only I, way I, mutation I, works, Tom. You have to be able to... I, we're, we're not doing well, yeah, the exactly. thing unless we get to choose because well, I don't want to accidentally end up being Jubilee or some crap character like that. But it doesn't have to be useful. I mean, Eva's talking about stuff that would just be for cosmetic appearances, you know, like some, some glowing spots on your face because it looks cool. Yeah. That'll yeah, be the idea the is that it would be it's it's cosmetic but it's permanent but not just like it doesn't fade like ink. It's a part of you now. You've put that in your genes. Like who knows if like, you know, maybe there's a mess up and suddenly you're passing it on and all your kids are glowing. It's a, this crazy idea that you if you keep um like mutating how people look and changing everyone until nobody really knows what like people look like normal anymore, maybe blue hair's a natural thing now. Yeah, Bluebeard, literally. <laughs> I, I think we combine this with your previous prediction and advertisements start to get implanted bioluminescent <laughs> on your face. Yeah, that's right. So, a big Pepsi logo on your back when you're out right. swimming. Yeah. And then you could go in when you switch over, you go in and get the RC Cola logo and just yeah. have it surgically replaced. Or maybe it's so designer that they can just like remotely change it. No one likes the RC Cola guy. <laughs> poor, poor RC Cola guy. All right, let's, uh, let's go over to you, Mignon. These are the, in 100 years, we'll be in a flying car sort of stuff. What do you got for us? Well, in 100 years, I think energy is going to be so expensive that things we consider disposable today won't be disposable anymore. I mean, we, I was joking with my husband the other day. He spilled chocolate on his shirt, and he's like, it's two dollars maybe I should just throw it away and get another one <laughs> you know instead of trying to get the stain out right. and I remember when I was a kid my mom would darn socks she would mend holes in socks and like that would never cross my mind I would never consider darning a sock that we consider them disposable now and I think things especially things like clothes that are so inexpensive right now will become expensive because of the increased energy cost so i think that we'll go back to sort of a repairman culture you know the tv repairmen were put out of business the vacuum cleaner repairmen were put out of business because products got so cheap and i think we're, we'll see a resurgence of people who make their living repairing things and we'll see a, a change in attitude so that many things we consider disposable today we won't consider disposable anymore do you think that'll impact um i always think about like when when that was more of a prominent thing, you had a, a shoe repairman and you had somebody who was darning socks and you had somebody else who was fixing, you know, uh, buttons on your suit or whatever, or letting the suit out as you gained weight or whatever the thing is that people would do and you wouldn't just go out and buy a new suit. 
Did that, did it historically have an impact on trends and would it now? So for example, if it was really easy for me or, or became uh, economically uh, feasible that I had to get things fixed instead of buying them new, would, would styles and trends kind of slow and would that therefore be another ding on the economy? I just think about the, the impact of, you know, because if you just keep wearing the same jeans and get them patched until you can't wear them anymore, that seems like that would slow down sort of the yearly what's hot you know what what colors are in what pants should i be wearing and it seems like that in turn would ding the same the self same economy i agree i think it would slow down the economy and it would people people would still have a sense of wanting to have their own personal style and change what they're wearing but i think it would be smaller things like accessories maybe you'd get a new collar on your shirt but you'd keep the same shirt you would maybe take it in at the waist but to change the you know the the shape of it but you'd be altering the same items instead of just giving them away or throwing them away and buying new items in you know, just kind of how now people buy skins for their phones and things like that to personalize them I mean there, there will be a desire for new technology I don't think we're going to shed our desire for the latest new gadget but things that can be easily updated or saved or altered I think that we'll, there'll be much more of a drive to do that I, I, you know, I think you're on to something for sure, and I think it might run along class lines to begin with, uh, and I'm, th I'm thinking specifically of food. Uh, so, so what you're saying is we've had all these cheap things that were uh, more expensive to repair than replace, so we just replace them and we get rid of them, and that starts to change. And we're actually seeing that with food. I think we've talked about this before, uh, where the ingredients for food are very cheap, but we started to realize that they're actually not good. They don't taste good, they're not good for us. Uh, and so if you can't afford it, you start to shop at Whole Foods, you start to shop at the organic store, you try to buy locally, and you start, you start to put together something that is better for you, but costs more. Uh, and I see an analog here where people start to say, well, wait a minute, you know, now that I can afford it, I'm not gonna buy that, that cheap, Night, you know, uh, artificial, uh, sh uh, artificial thread shirt. What I want to say nylon, but it's not nylon. <laughs> polyester. I was, uh, that cheap polyester shirt. I'm going to buy a really good shirt. I'm going to buy it made by a tailor. And and when it rips, I've paid enough for the shirt that I'm going to go sew it up or get somebody to sew it up for me. And it starts to become a status symbol. The way organics have become sort of a status symbol of like, oh no, I I fix my things. I, I and and I think. You know, the broadly, uh, you know, people who don't make as much money will continue to have to buy those consumer goods that are replaceable. Uh, but I, I, I see that not lasting forever, but that trend kind of moving that way. So maybe nanotech is the answer. We always bring up nanotechnology on the show. And since this is a little far flung in the future, you know, the idea that, that our things would last longer because we came up with nanotechnology that could easily repair um, stuff, whether it be clothes or other synth synthetics or computers or devices or whatever. Um, that seems to me like a, a, a great way to apply that technology is to make things last longer. And if they're, if they're broken, a, a quicker, easier, less expensive fix so that we don't have to rush right out and buy the next one or buy another one or, or whatever. Yeah, but wouldn't that make them... Wait, Wouldn't that make I... it more expensive, though? To if you're because if energy is the expensive part, then having the thing or replacing it by hand, like having, you know, a mechanic or like the VCR repair shop, um, then that's that turns into you know human labor. That's not so expensive. If energy is the expensive component, then nanotechnology it seems almost prohibitively prohibitively expensive, and so you know. You're like what are you gonna like every time you have to shock them to make them fix their thing or do whatever you know like send the pulses you're you're spending hundreds of dollars at this point like to constantly repair things I mean that would almost be where you end up with your your class line of what's the expensive thing that can fix itself versus what's the thing I have to take down to Joe at the shop but then you end up with this this uh, local economy that is actually going to end up doing better because you're relying more on each other, you have a stronger community, um, and I think that in the end that could actually turn things the other way. And that author who doesn't make as much money on his ebooks anymore can supplement his income by <laughs> being like, vacuum cleaners. Yeah, <laughs> an artisan <laughs> vacuum cleaner repairman. Yep. Brilliant. I think I, you know I, I joke, but I, I do think uh, I think I do think there's something to that for sure. 
All right, let's move on to the crazy-ass predictions. And Mignon, we'll stay with you. One really far out there forecast. What do you got for us? So I'm a terrible pessimist. So I think that in 10,000 years, 90% of humanity will be dead. I think we'll find some way to become nearly extinct, whether it's nuclear bombs or an asteroid hitting the Earth or global warming. I mean, they're, we're actually quite fragile, and there are many ways we could wipe ourselves out. So I think history will repeat itself. Um, my brother spent the summer at a survival camp, and he came back and told me only 2% of people know how to start fire without matches. Oh, wow. So, you know, once the matches run out, we're all gonna we're all gonna die. We're gonna freeze to death. But so there'll be a short period of time where people who know how to survive, how to hunt and build fire will be the the status members of society. But because people will remember technology, I think that phase will go by very quickly. And then people who can remember technology, people who can decipher the remaining information about how to rebuild a modern civilization, I think those people will become the most esteemed people in the society. So I think it'll go through the same, you know, historical pattern, agrarian, hunter-gatherer, you know, but I think that that will be very short and then technology will quickly rise again and the people who can understand technology and teach technology and build it will be the most um, prominent members of society. Sounds like you'll have uh, you'll have a <laughs> society will have, will have this huge sort of influx of Eagle Scouts because they really are the last bastion of how do you make a fire tie a knot and kill a thing. Like there really isn't any other sort of childhood based training for these kinds of basic human skills. And they're doing it, you know, every weekend they're going out there and they're learning how to camp and make their own fires and keep warm. And they're doing, you know, survival camps in the winter and, Seems like they'll be this elite you're talking about for a little while. Hopefully that means they'll be a very, you know, benevolent elite. They'll help old ladies across the street and be very kind and and then they'll still obey the scout law and the oath and all that. But eventually the uh I, I agree with you, the tech comes back, it ends up being the thing that happens. And this is true of all societies throughout the ages. The technology maybe only got so far in those in those societies before things fell apart, but ultimately everybody reaches further and further down that road and I, I don't think there's any way of getting around it but for the meantime in the meantime we got scouts to take care of so we'll be fine we'll start all the <laughs> fires we need you know people hope. people actually know more in aggregate than we give humanity credit for there's so many people who are just interested in things or or decide to you know be more self-reliant and learn things and i think that's okay i think if all of us had to know everything to survive in the wild we wouldn't be able to advance humanity as far as it has gotten. Specialization allows us to spend the time to learn about things like electricity and electronics and space flight. You know, if, the, if those guys from, from NASA all had to, you know, build uh, their own fires every night, they wouldn't have a lot of time to actually send the space shuttle up. So I'm glad that we can specialize. Uh, but at the same time, they're absolutely is an importance to making sure we have enough of that knowledge preserved, right? And, it, and I, th I think that's an important part of this prediction. Eva, do you know how to build your own fire from scratch? <laughs> I do, actually. Cause See? I, uh, I was a Girl Scout, and I went to um, a nature, like, camp out kind of camp. So I would learn all that kind of stuff of how to build a fire and, like, how to garden and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, definitely uh, those would be the people who would do the better. But even then, we're all so pampered that, you know, if some sort of devastation were to happen, yeah, I, most of us wouldn't make it anyways. I mean, find, even if you know how, finding water is really difficult. <laughs> so. so do you, Mignon, do you worry in like the world of authorship that we get so reliant on technology that eventually we forget how to write and we're not writing on paper, we don't know what that is anymore, there, we, we lose the ability to share the stories because things are getting so automated and so so digital that when that all comes crashing down, that's all just vapor and what are we left with and those skills are, have, have waned or is that not really a fear you have? No, I worry very much about the loss of a physical record of writings. You know, if things are published as ebooks and there's no physical book to put in a library somewhere, they're exceptionally vulnerable to destruction. I mean, you know, hard drives die. It's, you know, there could be a, I forget what they're called, but I read about some storm that can wipe out all electronic devices. And, you know, paper can burn. It's true. Paper is vulnerable too. But if you have copies of books in 10 libraries around the world, 
odds are good that one of them will survive. But if everything is electronic, there, it, I think it's at great risk. But I think librarians are very aware of that problem and taking action or, you know, taking steps to try to preserve paper records of things. And I vaguely remember reading that the Internet Archive people, the people who founded the Wayback Machine, are now focusing on physical books. They're That's focusing right. On oh, and physical Mignon, books. we're getting a little... Uh, uh, interference from your from your mic it sounds like usually if mm. people unplug the headset and plug it back in and fixes it it's just that kind of okay. Okay. crackling interference it's a driver it's the c media driver uh you know some, we know way too much about yeah uh see and and if i ever in the wild need to save my life from a bear by knowing what driver caused the crackling in the <laughs> usb headset i will survive <laughs> so, this, so, wait, so this thing archive.org is yeah. doing with physical books um, is, is, is pretty fascinating to me because it's a real switch around for, for the, and I forget his name, but the founder of all that, it's kind of a, it's a real switch for his mentality about Brewster what really Kale. should be preserved. Yeah. And so, Mignon, what, how, do you feel like that's, is, is that going to save us or is there something else? Is this a good start? Like what are we, what's going to come of that? As long as we don't burn all the books because we get too cold, I think it's a good solution. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting dichotomy, and I think Archive is pointing out that you kind of need to do both because, on the one hand, yeah, if you have ten copies of books in ten libraries around the world, you've got a good chance that they'll survive, and you can rest, you can be done. Uh, but there's still a chance that maybe all ten copies would get destroyed, and it's harder to produce multiple copies. Whereas with digital files, you can produce an unlimited number of copies. So you can have them in millions of places around the world. And as long as you keep copying them, you can keep ahead of hard drives crashing and, and all of that, and which is what Archive is doing. Uh, but they're hedging their bets and they're saying, well, you know what, we're not going to trust just one method. And that's redundancy is always the, the best way to protect something, I think. Well, if you're going to do that, then what you need to set up as part of the Archive is a way for it to be read, you know, in the, the thousands of years or whatever, um, so that should something happen to civilization, there's a way for the people who are left to get back to that inf information. You know, it's like, you know, all those movies where you have the people stumble into the room and they push, like, the button on the wall and everything comes to life. You'd have to set something, some sort of, of um, vault that system that's prepared for that day to arrive kind of thing. Um, and that, that's the ultimate way to, to preserve both the books and the digital format is they have to be kept some, somewhere safe or, or a copy of that one day is accessible. Yeah, the scary part is one day we're going to be, we'll, we'll move beyond the, the publishing of the books themselves. We won't have physical copies to hang on to or if, or if we're not careful, we'll quit doing that. We need to keep doing that. But if I put out an ebook tomorrow, Chances are there's no printed equivalent, at least not yet, because I'm. This is now the easy way to test the water, to get it out there, low cost for me, uh, at least some return on my effort, without having to go through all the rigmarole of printing 50,000 copies or whatever. Um, and you know, despite services like Lulu and others, where you can kind of do this in one or one or two off, you know, copies of a book, it feels like more and more of this archival data is not going to be archived. We're going to be just going on straight digital, and then we'll forget to make printed copies of things. So I think that's the big fear long, long term is that we just, this gets so convenient and easy and so low cost that we don't bother to have hard copies of things. And we just sort of move on to a future that we think we're secure in, but we're really not. And we can't even read it in the future anyway, because we forget the language. I mean, that has happened to us. There, there are still to this day ancient documents. We have no idea what they say because we don't know what the language is, you know, and, yeah. and until the Rosetta Stone came along, there were, there were many, many more documents like that, and we just kind of lucked out that there was this one where, like, hey, we know one of those languages, and well, now we can start to decode the others. So that is important, too, not just to be able to read physically the data and display it, but how to interpret it as well. Yep, yep. All right, Eva, we're going to go over to you. Uh, you're in 2,000 years. We'll all be made of goat's milk. Or something like that. What do you got for us? Oh, I hope not. Um, all right. So actually, mine plays very well into uh, uh, Midian's uh, uh, prediction in that um, I was going a little more on the positive end, where I think we'll evolve um, technologically, te technologically as we go so much that um, people will forget how things are done, like we'll have robots making everything for us, that so few people actually know how stuff works. I mean, you find it today, a lot of people don't know how 
how most of the things in their house work. Um, but it's, it'll evolve to such a point where it's such a, a specialized, small amount of people who know that, that technology almost becomes magic, where things just work because they do, and you have to go see the wizard to get things fixed because that's just how the world works all of a sudden. Like, over time, we just forget. Like, you guys were talking a little bit about last week how people don't, like, people forget the information, but they remember where it's at. Um, and this would be the same kind of thing where, like, you, for, you know that these things do work and that there is a reason, but you don't understand the laws of how it works anymore, and, and you have to go find those right people, and those people are the, the important people or the, the wealthy or, or just the, that cast of people almost. And it's that, the idea that technology will become magical to us. So in a, so in a way, we'll, um, we'll reverse what I think is the trend right now, which is make it yourself. Like we've figured out ways to hack things and make, you know, somebody can go and make a TV or a computer or some device, and then we get it home and we go, all right, well, now I'm going to jailbreak this thing and I'm going to put my own software on it. I'm going to run the wires the way I want to, and I can totally, you know, reverse engineer this thing that once, you know, in the 70s, let's say, we'd see a Walkman and go, bah, the holy Walkman, and we'd, we'd, we'd bow to it. We wouldn't know what to do with it. And it seems like now we've kind of conquered that. Very common, average folk have figured out a way to sort of hack into things and make them more usable, uh, let's say. You think we'll, we'll get away from that? That'll, that'll shift and, we'll, and things will get either more complicated or we'll just stop caring about... Yeah, I think that the idea, is, the idea is that like, things become so complex. Like we're talking about getting into you know, resistors that are, are the size of atoms. Like stuff becomes so complicated that only the people who pursue that knowledge um, know how to how it works and understand it. And like this is like thousands of years. So so you know our computers are probably autonomous at this point, and they're they're taking care of everything. So it's sort of like. Yeah, you don't, you don't need to know anymore. You don't need to have to do it because everything works when you want it to work. You don't have to hack your phone because you can just tell your phone, I want you to do this now. And so it's all, it's all built into the system that everything just happens the way you want it to be. So it's Apple wins. Utopia. Apple wins. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was talking want. with my family about the repair culture idea, they're saying, well, what about cars? And, you know, our grandparents fixed their own cars. They changed their own oil. And cars have become so computerized that most people don't do that anymore. If your car needs repairing, you still have to take it to a very specialized place with computer diagnostics. And so that was something I was thinking wouldn't become part of the repair culture because it was so complicated. And, you know, it makes sense that as technology advances more and more, if we don't wipe ourselves out, that, uh, you know, it'll be harder and harder in the long run for people to fix their own gadgets. Well, my, my dad was a, was a genius with cars. I mean, he could take any car previous to a certain year, let's say, let's say previous to a, a late 90s model, and he could fix it. It didn't matter what was wrong. He knew exactly what he could do. He knew where the parts would be. He knew what to jing, jingle and jangle. He knew if you didn't have to replace anything, just unplug something, plug it back in. And then something happened, late 90s or so, where cars quit being like that, and they started to be totally integrated and totally chip dependent and all this sort of thing and it felt and it felt it was a very tangible thing for me to watch my dad kind of look at a car and go oh my gosh all this stuff that i've known i don't know it anymore because it's no longer really in the car it's not a car tech it's a it's another tech applied to cars that i'm not trained in that i don't understand and he i, th I think we even had conversations about it. it's like the two would have a hard time figuring each other out like really good car people would never quite get along with really smart computer technicians who made the car better because of all this integration. And so I completely agree. That's a great example, actually. Maybe the best example of where we lose a little bit of, um, you know, our, our, our ability to, to work on stuff like that because now a car is completely out of my reach. It's not even close to something I'd work on. I have to have a dealership or a, or a you know, a smart mechanic who can do it. And even in those cases, it's so hard to find good ones. And probably part of that is that it's really complicated. And there's lots of models and there's new hybrids and there's battery only cars now. And who knows what the crap's under those hoods. So, yeah, I, don't, I, I fear for our children. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a cycle, right? Any, any sufficient technology is developed to make your life easier, to make something simpler, to make it easier to work. And yet, once you do that, it makes it more complex to maintain or repair. Uh, you know, wheels 
made it much easier to get stuff around, right? But you had to know how to make a wheel and how to maintain the wheel and how it worked with an axle, and you had to learn that. And, and it seems simple to us now because they're so pervasive, but how many of us, uh, going back to fire, for instance, can make a fire out of nothing? We've, we've moved beyond that. We, we assume these things, and they're easy to get. They're easy to find. So we're like, well, yeah, if I want a wheel, I go down to the Home Depot and I buy one. You know, I don't, I don't have to make one that's perfectly round, but could you? Uh, and, and I think that just continues on and on. Now, cars are a great example. We have self-parking and a collision avoidance and lane change, and eventually that's going to grow and grow and grow until the idea of repairing a car is going to sound as silly as repairing a microchip. Uh, it's like, well, no, that's not what a car is. A car is this thing that knows how to drive itself around eventually in, you know, in our crazy-ass predictions. And you, of course you take it to a technician uh, to, to repair it. That's, that's, you, know, you need somebody with the expertise because it's a very important thing. It's just we'll slowly change how we think about all of this technology as it goes. But anytime there's a transition, the, te the, the temptation is to resist it because you understood the old way and you don't want to change. And that, that's why Scott fears for his children. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You have, you've, you've nailed it, actually. I think I have, a, I have a larger problem that this show can't quite contain today. <laughs> well, then I guess all we're left with is four questions. <laughs> well, four questions, Tom. I know the sound of that. That means we're going to ask our guests four questions. Rapid fire style. That means they can't think too much about their answers. They must answer from the gut. Ladies, are you ready for your four questions? Okay. <laughs> Mignon, I'm asking you first. Here are your questions. Tom will ask Eva. Here we go. Okay. If a single animal could suddenly begin speaking and became the ultimate human companion, which animal do you hope it is? Oh, dogs. Oh, all right. Perfect. I wonder what they'd say. Uh, what do you <laughs> pay? <laughs> what do you pay, or what would you pay for a trip to Mars and back? Not That's much. It sounds dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> back in my day, I don't think you could pay me cars. to go. <laughs> yeah. uh, finally, when it, uh, or not finally, third question: When it comes to smartphones, how smart is too smart? I want them as smart as possible. I want that phone to do everything for me. All right, and no one will be able to repair it. <laughs> uh, It'll finally, repair itself. <laughs> la last question: Which sci-fi trick would you rather have? The ability to perform a successful Vulcan neck pinch, or a small wand that would make others forget everything they experienced for the last four hours? Ooh, uh, the Vulcan neck pinch. Mm. Yeah, it would keep me safer. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Very um, practical. Just a, re a reminder, our listeners: If you watch Star Trek V, the bad one. Uh, the one that Kirk directed. There is a scene where Spock gives the Vulcan neck pinch to a horse. It is absolutely the most wonderful thing you'll ever see in film history. So go watch that movie. Tom, over to you. All right. Eva, are you sitting comfortably? Uh, yeah, sure. Good. Then we'll begin. Question number one. Will there ever be an exact robot replica of you, and what will it do? Oh, That'd be actually kind of nice. I'd be able to trade places all the time, and I could get more sleep. Um, but I don't think so, because um, I won't be around at that point. Ah, it it will just replace you. No. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. Question number two: How long will the Olympics continue, and will they always be human only? I think they'll stay human, but we'll probably in the you know another hundred years or so start augmenting ourselves when we do it, um, whether it's drugs or you know cyber. Cybertronically, yeah, some kind of some kind of uh, extra leg. Yeah, or, or like just yeah, like sprinters start having like the muscles and the pistons in them. Yeah, and yeah. Cyborg Olympics. Yeah. Uh, the, robot, the robot Olympics and Futurama are really good. They me. are. They're pretty fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Question number three: When will visual effects finally replace reality? Oh, well, I think it's coming sooner than we think. Um, we were working on, you know, like the hologram rooms and everything, 3D projection. Are you working on glasses. the holodeck? Wait, uh, I'm not, but oh. somebody is. Right. And it, uh, it'll happen maybe, I would say, even in the next 20 years. We'll wow. start seeing prototypes of stuff. Excellent. Then you will become extra rich because you'll be so in demand to create realities. <laughs> I, I hope. I could only, only hope. <laughs> and question number four, when will Firefly come back? Uh, 
when you're we in LA. The point where we, uh, <laughs> well, we're actually in Firefly and we're flying to space. So we have to wait for the holodeck, and then you can just make your own. <laughs> sure, there you go. Uh, yeah. All right. Excellent. Uh, well answered. And sadly, that brings us to the end of our show. Thank you both uh, for sharing your visions of the future with us. This has been great. Thank you. It's been fun. Uh, Mignon Fogarty, grammar girl and uh, founder of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcasting network. Let us know where we can find your stuff online and what you're up to these days. You can find me at quickanddirtytips.com. That's my network. And I'm Grammar Girl at Twitter. I spend a lot of time there. And I'm, I just had three new books launched last week. Uh, two of them are 101 words books. And I have another one coming out in November. So I've been writing lots of books. Excellent. <laughs> Check them out, folks. Uh, she does great work if you're interested in language especially. Uh, and quick and dirty tips. Also, Eva Snyder, thank you for joining us. Uh, let us know what you're up to and where folks can find your stuff online. Uh, well, I like conversation on Twitter, so I'm always up for talking about movies or anything. Um, so at Angel Mercury. Um, otherwise, go see movies in the cinema because you might see something that I worked on. Um, and then, actually, I worked on a short that's going to be at Comic Con, um, Room Seven A B, uh, Friday night. If you come by the TRS panel, you might get to see something special. Oh. So um, you should check it out. Excellent. Oh, I heard something about this. Very cool. Nice. People should check that out. All right, Scott, uh, what else should people check out? People should check out, oh, my gosh, Tom, so many things. They should check out Sword and Laser on the Frog Pants Network. Never it's heard of it. It's a show that Tom Merritt and Veronica Belmont oh, host right. about swords and lasers, and I recommend it highly. It's, uh, you can learn more at frogpants.com or at swordandlaser.com. How about that? How about that? How about uh -huh. that short and later? All right, thank you, folks, uh, for watching. Don't forget, you can email the show. Send us your predictions. Come on, forecastpodcast at gmail.com. We'll see you next time. Bye. Well, thank you, guys. That was awesome. Thank you. That was great. Yeah, yeah this is fun. Good conversation. Yeah, those guys were awesome. Thank you so, so much. Thanks for putting up with our troubleshooting at the beginning. No problem. No problem. We'll catch you online. All right. Yeah. We'll let you right. uh, go now. We've got to clear out for All About Android coming up next. What do you think they'll talk about? I think, Tom, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Yeah. This is totally, um, trust me, I don't want any emails all or right, letters. Right. I think they're going to talk about Android. <laughs> I don't know. Seems like a stretch. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's one of those deceptive names. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's, they just picked it because it sounded cool. I see. And then they're, they're going to talk about, like, horse breeding. <laughs> oh, gosh. I was just about to say chicken breeding, and I'm not kidding. No you're, kidding. You're weirding me out. Yeah, that was weird.